Today's speaker is Dr. Michael Pakanowski, who is currently the Associate Director of Genomic and Targeted Therapy in the FDA's Office of Clinical Pharmacology. During his tenure at the FDA, he has advised on scientific and regulatory aspects of hundreds of biologic, biomarker, and diagnostic products. In 2004, Michael received his doctorate in pharmacy degree from the University of Science in Philadelphia and a master's in public health from the University of Florida in 2008. He completed research in clinical pharmacology at Bassett Healthcare and a clinical research fellowship in cardiovascular pharmacogenetics at the University of Florida. Please enjoy today's lecture. Hello, my name is Mike Pakanowski. I'm the Associate Director for Genomics and Targeted Therapy in the Office of Clinical Pharmacology at FDA. As part of this course, you'll have three lectures on the topic of pharmacogenomics related to general principles of pharmacogenomic study designs, dosing of drugs that have pharmacogenetic interactions, as well as the clinical implementation of pharmacogenetic testing. In this initial lecture, we'll walk through the general principles of pharmacogenomics research and clinical study design and walk through some representative case studies related to pharmacokinetics, drug response, and drug safety. In closing, we'll touch on a couple of issues that are generally related to the regulatory environment and drug development context for application of pharmacogenomics. As part of this lecture, we'll cover some basic principles in how pharmacogenomic studies are conducted. We'll walk through a couple of case studies related to drug disposition, response, safety, as well as multifactorial approaches to implementing pharmacogenetic testing, and then at the end, briefly touch on some issues related to drug development, regulation, uh, and clinical practice. Now, we all know that drug responses can be highly variable. In fact, the numbers needed to treat for most of the highest grossing drugs in the United States ranges anywhere from 4 to 25, based on a recent publication. That is, you need to treat that many people in order to derive one clinical benefit and a single positive outcome. At the individual level, having to try multiple drugs or take a medicine that is being used to prevent a life-threatening event without any way to monitor it uh, is clearly not the ideal scenario for uh, practicing medicine. So the obvious solution to this would be to have some non-invasive means to identify which patients are going to respond well, whether the drug might need to be dose adjusted, or whether an adverse event has a higher chance of occurring. And ideally, you'd want to take out those individuals and treat them differently, either excluding them from treatment altogether or adjusting doses, or alternatively, selecting those patients in whom the drug is expected to work, enriching the population for those responders and treating with standard doses where there is a positive benefit risk relationship. Now, I think we can all appreciate how such precise discrimination of responders versus tox resp toxic responders is really pure fantasy. We humans are very complex biological systems, but practically speaking, clinical decision making is mostly binary, and this is how it sorts itself out in the clinic. Now, precision medicine has become the term of art to describe the approach to healthcare that I just mentioned. Each of us conceivably has different environmental exposures, concomitant medications, body habitus, and so on, and all of these features could possibly influence where we fall in the distribution of responses. Now, pharmacogenomics is one aspect of precision medicine that's garnered a tremendous amount of attention because we have seen incredible advances in the ability to examine the human genome at a scale that wasn't really possible just even a decade ago. Now, put simply, pharmacogenomics is really just the study of DNA and RNA characteristics as related to drug response. This definition is obviously quite broad and covers everything from clinical or non-clinical studies of discrete DNA sequence variations that can impact drug disposition, response, or therapeutic outcomes, all the way to the use of gene expression profiles as pharmacodynamic response biomarkers. But under the umbrella of precision medicine, we are generally mostly talking about the use of genetic tests to predict drug response. So armed with the ability to interrogate the human genome, we now have the ability to better define the pathology of a given disease, and an understanding of that mechanism sheds greater light on how to manage it, or perhaps even alter its course, through pharmacological interventions. Apart from disease-related factors, use of the drug itself can benefit from an understanding of what drives variability in exposure and what types of monitoring might be needed to ensure that the therapy is having its intended benefit without causing any toxicities. So, in actuality, what we have the ability to do is understand where a certain subset of patients may fall in the response distribution. And there will be individuals that we would expect to respond who do not and others that will benefit greatly even if we are not anticipating that they will respond. 
Now, pharmacogenomics has a very long history that predates completion of the Human Genome Project in 2004, perhaps dating back all the way to observations that some individuals don't have the ability to taste phenylthiourea in the 1930s, and perhaps even farther back to the observation that certain people uh, do not tolerate eating fava beans very well. However, in the past decade, we've made a really remarkable progress in our ability to study the human genome. Following the initial sequencing of the human genome, the HapMap project gave us a really clear map on the human genetic variation across populations and shed light on uh, new markers that were discovered through the use of genome-wide association studies. Now, these were very large studies that had the ability to look across the entire genome to identify novel markers of response. Uh, fast forward a couple of years, we have the first personal genome that was sequenced, and then more recently, uh, we have numbers of genome-wide association studies that have been published, and with advances in sequencing technologies, have now generated full whole genome sequences on tens if not hundreds of thousands of individuals. So we've really made quite a bit of progress in terms of our ability to study the genome as well as identify novel markers of disease that would not have been uncovered previously. So what do we know now? Well, we know that our haploid genome has about 3.25 billion uh, nucleotide base pairs. Uh, in that, there's about 20,000 protein coding genes and about 40,000 non-coding RNAs and pseudogenes. And what makes up the, the variation among humans is really a small portion of variation in the human genome. And we've identified roughly 10 million single nucleotide polymorphisms and many more rare variants now that sequencing studies have become uh, much more common. So there's a number of different types of DNA variations that distinguish uh, each of us individually. So I won't bore you with basic biochemistry, but the, the central dogma of molecular biology is, you know, DNA is the basic sequence from which RNA is coded, produces mRNA, and that's translated into a protein. Now there's a number of different single nucleotide variations that can disrupt the amino acid translation uh, by way of changing the, the three base codon that is the basis of encoding the amino acid. There are a number of changes also that produce what are called synonymous changes, which don't disrupt the amino acid that's encoded, but do disrupt the sequence. There are also a number of non-coding variations in untranslated regions, splice sites, and intergenic regions of the genome that we still have much to learn about. Uh, on the more severe side of the equation, there are a number of frame shift mutations that can alter the, the reading frame as well as insertions and deletions that could potentially disrupt the ultimate protein that's encoded by a gene. Uh, there are other variations, such as you can have different copies of a particular gene, which can produce higher effects of the higher expression of the protein, as well as epigenetic changes related to, to methylation patterns. So with all of this, what can genomic biomarkers tell us? Well, being that these are relatively static biomarkers, they're very useful at as a predictive factor or as a diagnostic factor. So a biomarker that's genetic in nature can tell us if you're susceptible to a given disease. For example, BRCA mutations are a common risk factor for the development of breast cancer. It can also be used in the diagnosis. For example, CF cystic fibrosis is uh, in part diagnosed by sequencing the gene to understand whether or not there are mutations present. There can be prognostic differences, which might tell you in a patient who has a disease, how long uh, they might live or what type of morbidity they might expect, uh, as well as predictive biomarkers that can be used to predict a response to an individual treatment. A common example of this is the BRAF mutations in the setting of skin cancer. Now, not all drugs necessarily require a pharmacogenetic test. Clearly, if you have a drug that is used to treat something symptomatic in nature, has a very wide therapeutic margin, and is used for a short period of time, you might not expect necessarily uh, to be concerned about chronic toxicities, for example, and you can evaluate an individual patient response and whether or not they should continue to use that medication. But there are a number of cases where pharmacogenomic markers can be useful. Uh, some of those are highlighted here. So there are many drugs that have exhibited multimodal PK, where you see uh, differences in the distribution of concentration. Uh, there are many drugs that have narrow therapeutic indices, where toxicity and benefit is a very uh, steep curve. There are also drugs that have very high variability in their pharmacokinetics or pharmacodynamics. Additionally, race effects tend to be 
on drug response tend to be a marker of some underlying genomic differences, uh, as has been the case with um, many of the, the polymorphic drug metabolizing enzymes. And there are certainly drugs that cause uh, adverse reactions that we really don't quite understand the mechanism, and pharmacogenomics can be a useful tool to understand the mechanism of those toxicities, as well as to shift the risk benefit through patient selection. So to go on, to go about identifying a pharmacogenomic biomarker, a basic study design follows one of a couple different types. Uh, you can use population cohort studies where you sample a population who might be exposed to a particular medication and evaluate whether there are treatment differences based on genetic factors uh, in that overall population. You can also sample patients based on whether or not they experience an adverse event or uh, an unfavorable treatment outcome or favorable treatment outcome in a case control type of study. Uh, much less commonly, there are case-only methods, and this is really useful only if you're interested in studying pharmacogenetic interactions uh, because you do not necessarily have a control population. So it really only tells you about uh, the presence of whether a gene is modifying the drug. So these are the basic uh, patient sampling approaches. Now once that is uh, set in place, just for practical reasons in most circumstances, uh, the next question then becomes how to select markers and what platform to use. Now we have now a number of different hypothesis-driven approaches where you lower throughput platforms are used to test single variations within a gene or multiple genes that we expect to have some biological relevance. Uh, but now more commonly, we often see hypothesis-free approaches, which is, relies on higher throughput platforms such as next-generation sequencing or genome-wide chips. And then once that's, uh, the data have been generated, it's a simple matter of analysis. And the basic question is really whether or not the marker frequency differs in cases versus controls or whether responses or outcomes differ based on the genotype. So it's rel relatively straightforward statistics from that point on. Now the gene type, genotyping approach, as I mentioned, um, can be either hypothesis-driven or hypothesis-free. Now we, with the left panel here, you can see that you could select genes in a particular drug disposition and response pathway that might affect absorption of the drug, its metabolism, as well as the drug target. And this is really useful for really well characterized and well understood functionally relevant variants that are identified within a gene. Uh, in addition, this is useful for drug metabolism and transport studies, or as well as, and as well as drug target and disease risk alleles. At the other end of the spectrum, you have hypothesis-free approaches, which are really useful when uh, the pharmacology is not well characterized and can be used to evaluate unresolved variability in drug disposition or response. Uh, one common uh, and very successful example was the number of genome-wide association studies that were conducted uh, to identify factors that were increased risk for type 2 diabetes. Uh, this is a study that was recently published looking at uh, exome sequencing, and one of the markers that came out of that was TCF7L2, uh, which has now been one of the most robust and reproducible susceptibility factors for type 2 diabetes. Now, the methods that we have have really evolved quite a bit over the past couple of years. Um, there have been a number of uh, more targeted types of genomic analyses that are depicted on the, the top, um, and some of the more recent next generation sequencing technologies shown on the bottom. It, not really relevant necessarily to go into the, the weeds of each of these different platforms, but suffice to say that we now have a number of different next generation sequencing methods that can generate gigabase, gigabases, if not terabases of data uh, in periods of hours and weeks rather than years. So the technology has advanced quite a bit. Now with the use of these higher throughput platforms and perhaps at some level even more candidate gene approaches, there's a couple of factors that must be considered in determining whether or not it's a clinically valid and real association with the disease. Uh, the first and foremost is replication. Uh, it's, it goes without saying that a study that has not shown uh, replication of a genetic factor that predisposes to a uh, health condition um, is, is not necessarily believable. And we need to see this in multiple studies that are independently conducted in different populations and using different designs. Uh, other factors that make a compelling argument that a genetic factor is indeed a real predictor of uh, human health is the magnitude of the effect. 
the statistical significance of its association in the, in the case of pharmacogenetics, whether or not there's a gene by drug interaction. Uh, and then the rest is really Bradford Hill criteria for epidemiological studies and making causal inferences from those. Things like analogy, is a drug interaction also indicative, present that would indicate that there's a genetic interaction, experimental support that establishes a mechanism by which a certain genetic factor uh, influences disease risk, a biological gradient, and concentration response in the setting of pharmacokinetic issues. Now once we have a, a valid biomarker in hand, we understand that it you know, has some basis for influencing uh, influencing health or disease. Uh, the next question then becomes, well, how is it managed? And what types of studies can be done to validate that it does in fact have a, a tangible impact? So the top left um, basically shows the, the typical design that's used to study uh, a pharmacogenetic interaction and also is very useful in understanding whether the biomarker does predict in fact what you think it does. So basically, patients would be enrolled and tested for a certain genetic characteristic, and then randomization would be stratified on the basis of that genetic factor to treatment A or treatment B. Um, so this not only gives you information about the effect of the treatment in the different subgroups of patients that are defined by the biomarker, but also about whether the biomarker uh, is prognostic versus predictive, because you have the ability to compare treatment-based outcomes by biomarker. What we see more commonly in the setting of drug development, at least in the setting of oncology, are enrichment types of trial designs where individuals with a certain biomarker might be selected and only those patients will be exposed to uh, the experimental and control interventions. Uh, there is a more hybrid design where that type of enrichment strategy can be used and you might follow individuals who are marker negative with a standard of care and this gives some insight as to whether or not the marker does have prognostic utility. And then at the far right corner, we have uh, a basic utility trial design where this actually doesn't necessarily evaluate the effectiveness of an intervention in particular subgroups of patients, but rather tests the utility and effectiveness of a genotyping strategy to alter treatments based on genetic status versus a usual standard of care type of approach. Now these are obviously very simplistic designs. There's uh, clearly a lot of variations on this. Uh, in the setting of oncology, there may be um, uh, some local testing uh, that's performed as part of an entry criterion into clinical trials. Uh, there may be adaptations to the study design that evaluate at an interim time point how the, the therapies are working and stopping rules may be in place if in a marker negative population, for example, the drug does not seem to be working. And uh, much more recently, we have a number of master protocols, so-called umbrella trials, uh, that are in place to establish a framework for testing and assigning patients to one of many different types of therapies on the basis of their genetic test results. So a lot of different options uh, for carrying forward uh, a valid biomarker into clinical trials. Now when the cl clinical trials are complete, um, it's not necessarily always uh, a simple type of analysis. Um, there's a number of different outcomes. So basically what you have here in red is a marker positive subgroup and in black the marker negative subgroup. And you can see in the top here the, the risk benefit of the risks or benefits of the experimental therapy uh, might be the same over a control in both the marker negative and positive patient populations. This would suggest that the biomarker is not predictive uh, in any way, shape, or form. However, it may still uh, have prognostic value insofar as it increases event rates, but the treatment might be effective at, um, equally effective at reducing risk in both of the biomarker-based subgroups. Um, the next series, you basically have subtle variations on differences in the treatment effect between biomarker negative and positive patients. Here, there's more subtle overlap in outcomes. Here, you have much more um, separation. And in some cases here, you might see no effect of an experimental therapy in the biomarker negative population. So there's a number of cases where um, each of these outcomes have been observed, uh, and it does raise the question of you know, whether a biomarker testing is useful uh, in terms of informing therapy, how well the control therapy does. Um, and seldomly, 
what we might see also is uh, at the bottom here where you have very clear separation, uh, you know, poor outcomes in the marker negative pop population with an experimental therapy, much better outcomes in the marker positive. Uh, and there was a case like this with one of the anti-EGFR uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors for lung cancer. So what I'll do for the next several minutes is go through a number of different case studies touching on a variety of different uses of pharmacogenetics uh, to look at drug disposition, response, safety, uh, and prediction of outcomes. So drug metabolism in transport is, is probably the most straightforward of the, the pharmacogenetic approaches. This is really the, the classical pharmacogenetics, if you will. Uh, you have here an example on the right of a drug where you might observe um, in a population type of study different peaks in the amount of drug that ends up getting into the blood. So you have on the far right here a number of patients who end up with very high exposures, a normal distribution here in the middle, and then some individuals that may eliminate the drug very quickly. Um, this has been observed with a number of CYP2D6 substrates uh, and is related to the fact that there's a lot of genetic variation underlying the activity of CYP2D6. Uh, so for CYP2D6, uh, many of the classical interactions uh, are for beta blockers, a lot of psychiatric drugs, uh, oligostat, tetrabenazine, and other related compounds, codeine, uh, dextromethorphan obviously being a probe, and adamoxetine. Uh, CYP2C9 also has some relevant interactions related to warfarin and some of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Uh, CYP2C19 with clopidogrel, voriconazole, proton pump inhibitors, and clobazam, and then a number of other uh, phase one and two metabolizing enzymes that are listed below. Uh, OATP1 is a transporter that also has genetic polymorphisms that can influence uh, drug disposition, um, particularly noted with the statins, where it's also been observed that it's a risk factor for developing uh, muscle toxicities. Now, one thing that's important to consider in looking at genetic variation in drug metabolism and transport is the variation that can occur across different racial and ethnic populations. Uh, you can see here down at the bottom uh, that there are a number of different genotypes that can basically be translated into an activity score which then would put an individual into one of these phenotypic categories. There's ultra-rapid metabolizers, extensive metabolizers, which for all intents and purposes are normal metabolizers, intermediate metabolizers, which have reduced function but not completely abolished, as well as poor metabolizers, where the ability of the enzyme to break down a substrate is virtually absent. And that's present in about 5 to 10% five to of the population um, in the United States. So you can see here up in the, the top portion, there's uh, a, a number of studies that were conducted looking at the genotype distribution. This is uh, one where they genotyped a large number of different populations and basically looked at the, the frequency of these different phenotypes across the populations. And you can see here there's some subtle variations across the different populations in terms of the frequency. Uh, you can see here there are some populations that very commonly have ultra-rapid metabolism and some where poor metabolism is relatively absent. So for 2D6, this, is, this has been observed. It's also important for CYP2C19, where poor metabolism is uh, much more common in populations in Southeast Asia, uh, as well as some of the other genetic uh, variations that are involved in, in drug metabolism. Now, one question that often comes up, as I mentioned before, is that uh, drug interactions um, are often analogous to uh, pharmacogenetic interactions. Uh, and, and we've looked at whether, um, you know, the data from a drug interaction study could be extrapolated to uh, inform a pharmacogenomic interaction. And we see that for CYP2D6, uh, where we have some relatively clean inhibitors of the enzyme and some relatively clean substrates, uh, that in a lot of cases, uh, when based on PBPK modeling, you can see that there is convergence between the drug interaction and the genetic interaction. Uh, this is also observed to some extent for CYP2C19, but less so for CYP2C9. And that's perhaps in part because of the fact that CYP2C9 genetic variations uh, tend to have some substrate specificity in terms of their impact on drug exposure, uh, and also perhaps because some of the inhibitors may uh, affect other pathways. Um, so it then begs the question of whether or not we can rely on the, the drug interaction studies or genetic studies to inform one or the other. 
And if you look at tertiary resources, uh, there's obviously a lot of clinically relevant drug interactions that are noted in, in resources that are used at the bedside. Uh, and you can see that uh, frequently the genetic interaction is also alluded to, um, even though patients may not be routinely tested. Uh, in terms of CYP2D6, you can see here there are about 33 drugs that had clinically relevant drug interaction in a tertiary resource. Uh, the drug-drug interaction was described in labeling in most, um, but the gene-drug interaction uh, description was not as common. So you can see that there is some gap here, but uh, it stands to reason that in most cases the information can be uh, portable from one to the other. Now I'll walk through a brief case uh, for atomoxetine. Uh, this is a drug that's a selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor that's used for the treatment of attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder. Uh, this drug is uh, metabolized quite extensively by CYP2D6, uh, as you can see down here, and it produces this 4-hydroxyatomoxetine uh, metabolite. And this is the major pathway of elimination. In the clinical studies uh, that were conducted even before the drug came to market, it was obvious that there was a clear separation in the distribution of concentrations that were observed in those studies. And you can see that there is a, a number of patients who had relatively low exposures uh, at the left of this figure, uh, reflecting the, the population that genetically is not able to eliminate the drug. And carrying that forward, you know, relative to, to normal metabolizers, poor metabolism for this drug uh, was shown to result in much higher exposures to the parent compound, roughly tenfold higher uh, areas under the curve and five-fold higher Cmax. Uh, there were higher rates of adverse events. You see roughly a doubling across uh, a number of different adverse events that are related to the drug. And because of that, the, the drug has dosing recommendations that are tailored based on genotype. So for those patients who are less than 70 kilograms, typically you, you'd give a half a milligram per kilogram per day and then titrate it up to a target dose of, of 1.2 milligrams per kilogram per day every three days based on their response and, and tolerability. Uh, and in patients who are over 70 kilograms, a similar approach starting at 40 and hopefully landing at 80. Uh, in those patients who take CYP2D6 inhibitors or known poor metabolizers based on genetic testing, uh, the recommendation is really to hold dosing titration for a period of four weeks until it's been well established that the patient tolerates the medicine well uh, or if symptoms are failing to improve. Uh, now, some would argue that, that this titration approach, which tends to be common across uh, a lot of the central nervous system drugs, um, actually might end up underdosing certain individuals, and that certainly is a, a possibility, and that's been suggested widely in the literature. Uh, but nonetheless, the poor metabolizers uh, do tend to have higher adverse event rates that, that could be treatment limiting. So we'll shift gears and speak a little bit about drug target pharmacogenomics evaluating mostly the, the efficacy of therapeutic products. Now, in the past several years, there have been a number of medicines that have been approved for only certain subsets of patients who are defined by molecular characteristics. You can see here there's a couple of drugs that have been approved for cystic fibrosis, uh, an, an oligonucleotide therapeutic for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and a number of different drugs for cancer. Uh, one of these, notably, was uh, recent approval of pembrolizumab for patients who have microsatellite instability high cancer or mismatch repair deficiency, uh, and that's agnostic to the type of tissue that the tumor was identified in. It's really targeting the, the molecular basis of the disease. So clearly this has become a common pathway uh, to, uh, to drug development, and you can see there are a number of uh, examples that have been approved. Uh, the first example we'll talk about is uh, cystic fibrosis. So cystic fibrosis is um, generally thought to be a disease of the lungs, although it has various manifestations throughout the body, but basically is a, a disease where there's reduction in the activity of a chloride transporter that results in loss of chloride transport. Uh, the gene for this was sequenced uh, back in 1989 by Francis Collins and others, uh, and really identified that there are certain patients with cystic fibrosis that have dysfunction in this transporter. And 20 years later, um, some would argue that that's quite a long time, uh, we finally now have therapies that potentially target this underlying defect uh, and have the potential to, to modify the disease course. So mutations in, in cystic fibrosis, uh, CFTR is the gene, uh, 
Uh, there are upwards of 2,000 that have been documented, and there are a few hundred that are known to be responsible for, for causing uh, the clinical manifestations of the disease. Uh, these have been broadly grouped into to different types of defects. Uh, some of them um, introduce uh, premature stop codons, resulting in uh, no synthesis of the protein. Uh, there are others that block the, the processing of the mature protein to the cell surface, and others that impact how well the channel uh, moves chloride. Uh, so uh, several years ago, there was a drug called Ivacaftor that was developed as a potentiator of CFTR. And basically, it works by opening the channel and increasing its channel open probability uh, for specifically for specific mutations that have a gating defect. And among the most common of those is the G551D mutation. Uh, Lumicaftor is another product that was approved. Uh, this acts to stabilize the CFTR conformation, which increases processing and trafficking of the mature protein to the cell surface. Uh, and this is approved in combination with Ivacaftor for patients who have the F508 deletion mutation. Now the clinical program for this really started out with um, comprehensive in vitro studies that demonstrated that Ivacaftor was active against certain forms of, uh, that against certain CFTR mutations, notably, as I mentioned, the G551D mutation. Uh, this is a mutation that's present in about 4% of CF patients, and the clinical trials that were designed to develop and approve this product uh, were basically conducted in, in this enriched population. Uh, so there were two clinical trials that showed a uh, clear benefit of Ivacaftor on lung function parameters in two clinical trials. Uh, there was also another clinical trial that was conducted in the more common F508 deletion mutation, which demonstrated that there was a small to no benefit, uh, which was consistent with the proposed mechanism of action of this product. Now, being that there's a number of rare mutations uh, that also are present that behave somewhat similar to the G551D mutation, uh, there were some additional studies that were conducted in patients who have uh, some of those rare mutations, and this was done uh, in a, a small prospective trial uh, where, again, the benefits on lung function were observed. Now, we've, we've come a long way with Ivacaftor. We've learned quite a lot about its benefit and risk profile over the years, uh, and more recently, um, based on the, the accumulated benefit and risk database uh, Ivacaftor was approved much more broadly for patients who had actually demonstrated in vitro responses. So this builds on the clinical database and now, given the confidence in the in vitro assay to adequately identify those patients who are likely to benefit, uh, the drug may be used in those patients where the mutation is documented to have uh, a response in the experimental studies. So you can uh, see here the indication now reads uh, Ivacaftor is a cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator that's indicated patients over the age of two uh, who have one mutation in the gene that is responsive to Ivacaftor based on clinical and or in vitro assay data. So it's not possible to really talk about precision medicine and, and pharmacogenomics without touching on uh, the, the setting of oncology. Uh, lung cancer is uh, among the more common causes of death from cancer in the United States, and we've come a long way in terms of our understanding of the molecular pathology of the disease. Uh, there have been a number of studies that have been performed very deep molecular profiling of a large number of tumor tissues uh, and show that there's quite a number of mutations and other factors that really are present that can drive a tumor and are thus amenable to treatment with certain certain drug products. So you can see on the left side here, uh, this was a study evaluating a number of different tumor tissue specimens and basically demonstrated that there's a number of mutations in all of the genes listed here uh, in each of the different specimens. And broken down on the right hand side here, you can see that there are a number of pathways that are particularly implicated. For example, EGFR is commonly mutated in lung cancers as well as KRAS. So these mutations um, really given us great insight into the molecular pathology of, of lung cancer and has uh, led to the approval of a number of different therapies. It's also raised a lot of complexities. Uh, 
Um, beyond the mutations and, and molecular profile that's shown here, there are also differences in methylation patterns, copy number variations, uh, P16 loss, and a number of other molecular aberrations uh, that can be detected in a tumor. So with all of that, it's obvious that each tumor can possibly be its own unique uh, entity. Now, gefitinib is a drug that has had a, a rather interesting history. Gefitinib uh, is an anti-EGFR uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor, and it was initially approved in 2003 under the Accelerated Approval Program for patients that had locally advanced or metastatic lung disease, lung cancer, after failing um, conventional chemotherapy regimens. Uh, the drug was approved, brought to market, and then the phase three confirmatory trial that was required as part of the accelerated approval process actually failed to demonstrate a benefit uh, in the non-small cell lung cancer patient population. In 2005, its use was restricted to patients receiving and benefiting from gefitinib, and several years later, the NDA was voluntarily withdrawn. Now, it's interesting because in this time period, we began to have uh, much greater insight into the molecular pathology as shown on the previous slide. And there was a number of studies evaluating the impact of EGFR mutations on the response to these, these medicines. So EGFR mutations are, are present in roughly 10% of, of tumors, uh, lung tumors. Uh, it does vary a bit based on ge geography. Uh, it tends to be more common in patients uh, in Southeast Asia. And you can see here, there's obviously a number of different mutations that can be present in the EGFR gene. Uh, most of them reside in the tyrosine kinase domain. Um, the ones that are of particular importance are in exon 19, where you see there's a number of different deletions that affect the, um, that affect the protein. Uh, in addition, there are some mutations that are present in exon 20, the most common of which is T790M, which is known to confer resistance to some of the drugs that target this particular um, this particular target. So the, the basis for um, gefitinib response in the setting of different mutations of uh, EGFR was really first established with the IPASS trial, which was a study of first-line gefitinib versus carboplatin and paclitaxel uh, in non-small cell lung cancer patients in East Asia who were light or never smokers a population that really in, in some way is already enriched for the presence of these types of mutations because the mutations tend to be more common in those two populations. And you can see here uh, with the survival plot up on the right hand corner in the EGFR mutation positive cohort you can see that there is a benefit of gefitinib over chemotherapy and in the mutation negative cohort you see that gefitinib patients tend to fare somewhat worse than conventional chemotherapy. So this shed light on the fact that there may be relevance of the TKI, relevance of uh, EGFR mutations in determining the response to gefitinib. Uh, it is worth noting that this population that was the basis for the genomic substudy of this clinical trial was relatively small relative to the overall trial population. You can see here that those without known EGFR mutation status, um, there were several hundred of those patients. Uh, whereas there was a couple hundred in uh, the mutation positive and negative cohorts collectively. So fast forward a couple of years, uh, there was another trial conducted that was performed in patients who had EGFR mutations detective in their tumor tissue. This was an open label single arm study uh, and really demonstrated that there were uh, very significant responses in terms of tumor shrinkage uh, in this cohort of, of patients. You see upwards of 75% response rates with a couple of complete responses. And the mutations that were largely enrolled in this trial were the exon 19 deletions being some of the most prevalent sensitizing mutations to TKI therapy, uh, but also uh, a couple of less common mutations. Now on the basis of this trial um, and the accumulated evidence about the relevance of mutations on the, the response to these types of medicines, uh, the new NDA was submitted and uh, subsequently it was approved and indicated for patients who have exon 19 deletions or the exon 21 substitution L858R. Uh, and this was as detected by an FDA approved test that was co-developed uh, and brought to market and approved simultaneously with uh, the approval of this indication. Uh, one thing that's worth noting, um, I mentioned there are a couple of other rare mutations that were included in the clinical trial. 
and the responses for those patients are shown um, basically in the clinical studies section of the labeling, though they're not necessarily included in, in the indications. Now the, uh, the companion diagnostic, which is a, a test that's essential for the safe and effective use of a drug product, uh, was brought to market with, uh, with the approval of the drug for this indication. And you can basically see that it's approved for the detection of the mutations uh, that are expected to respond, uh, but bears the caveat that efficacy has not really been well established in patients with some of these rare mutations. So that, that shows a, a typical um, drug development scenario where there's targeting of a specific, specific molecular defect. And there are a number of other uh, EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitors that have been approved uh, that share similar indications uh, with, for patients who have mutations uh, in the EGFR gene, such as a fatinib and erlotinib. So we'll shift gears again and talk a bit about safety pharmacogenomics. Uh, which is a very important and um, interesting issue that has a lot of its own unique challenges. Uh, over the years, there have been a number of different examples of how genetic factors can predispose one to developing an adverse event. Um, uh, some of those are listed here. Uh, you'll see that uh, a couple of them, such as for codeine and pimazide and citalopram, uh, a lot of it might be based on the disposition of the drug product. Uh, pimazide and citalopram, for example, tend to have higher concentrations in patients who are poor metabolizers of CYP2D6 and 2C19, respectively, uh, but both carry the potential for, for QT prolongation and, and arrhythmic events. Uh, codeine, on the other hand, is a prodrug that's activated by CYP2D6. Uh, in patients who are ultra-rapid metabolizers, they can get a lot of uh, the active metabolite, which is morphine. Uh, and then that produces toxic effects. And this has been particularly problematic for, uh, for young children, especially those who have undergone uh, tonsillectomies. Uh, valproic acid is an interesting case. Uh, it basically uh, was an adverse event that surfaced out of um, experience in, in young children who had a, a mitochondrial disorder that um, basically is defined by uh, the, the presence of fatal hepatic failure when exposed to, to valproic acid. Um, and this is the result of pol G mutations. Uh, so there were some safety-related labeling changes um, to, to warn physicians of, of this particular um, risk factor uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, and then on the more immunologic and idiosyncratic reaction front, uh, cutaneous reactions such as Stevens-Johnson syndrome have occurred with a number of drugs. Uh, phenytoin and carbamazepine are, are two such drugs where there's been interactions identified, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about carbamazepine. Uh, so cutaneous reactions uh, such as Stevens-Johnson syndrome or toxic epidermal necrolysis uh, occur in about 1 in 10,000 uh, of carbamazepine-treated patients. This is something that tends to be a bit more common, again, in, in Southeast Asian populations. Uh, but it's also an adverse reaction that tends to have very high case fatality. Uh, for those patients who, who develop uh, TEN, um, there is very significant morbidity and mortality associated with, with that adverse reaction. And you can see here on the right, the uh, adverse events are essentially defined by the, the coverage of the body surface area with um, this very severe desquamating rash. So there were uh, a number of studies that had been conducted uh, in China and Thailand and uh, various other countries uh, using case control approaches uh, basically that identified HLA-B1502 as a very significant risk factor for the development of Stevens-Johnson syndrome uh, in patients who had been exposed to carbamazepine. Uh, so this is uh, the results of a meta-analysis that was published which consisted of about 205 cases and 692 controls and you can see here at the bottom the odds ratio for uh, developing the adverse reaction was upwards of 80, which is very substantial in terms of being a predictor of uh, the risk for this uh, particular adverse reaction. Uh, based on you know, that accumulation of evidence, there were some changes to uh, the therapeutic products labeling. Uh, you can see here there's a boxed warning that, that describes some of the, the racial ethnic differences in the development of this adverse event, uh, but also goes on to recommend that certain um, 
certain individuals with ancestry that would cause this potential reaction to be more prevalent uh, be targeted for screening for HLA-B1502 prior to starting carbamazepine. And, you know, on the basis of a lot of these compelling findings, uh, some countries had implemented prospective screening programs where all patients who were candidates for carbamazepine were screened for this genetic risk allele um, and not treated with carbamazepine. And you can see here a um, paper that was published uh, a few years ago that basically all of the patients who were HLA-B1502 negative uh, went on to, to receive carbamazepine uh, and had a very low, if not any, incidence of uh, the severe skin reactions um, when about two in a thousand would have been observed uh, in the study population had screening not been performed. Now this is not always so straightforward. Um, clearly there's a potential for other anti-epileptic drugs to cause uh, Stevens-Johnson syndrome and severe cutaneous reactions. Uh, and in fact, for oxcarbazepine and phenytoin, there are published data that suggests that HLA-B1502 is a risk factor for developing skin reactions in patients exposed to those two drugs. Uh, Eslocarbazepine, uh, being structurally related to carbamazepine, um, at present doesn't have any very well-validated reports of Stevens-Johnson syndrome uh, as related to the HLA-B1502 allele, um, but stands to reason that potentially could carry the, the same risk. And there are studies in experimental models that have shown that there are common structural elements that do interact with HLA-B1502 across a number of these compounds, um, carbamazepine, oxcarbazepine, eslacarbazepine, and so on. Uh, so it is potential that by using one of these medicines in an HLA-B1502 positive individual uh, may also expose them to the risk for developing an adverse reaction. And this was the experience of uh, one region where st screening for HLA-B1502 was implemented. Uh, basically, uh, they saw elimination of Stevens-Johnson syndrome and TEN induced by uh, carbamazepine, uh, but they saw a rise in the number of reactions that were caused by phenytoin, which resulted in, in no obvious net difference in the rate of the adverse event. Uh, so it is important to consider the risks associated with alternative therapies uh, when prospectively managing some of these pharmacogenetic interactions. Um, now a lot of this has been, a lot of these studies have been performed in uh, primarily Asian populations. Uh, and a few years ago there were some studies that looked at uh, what risk factors were present in European populations. Uh, in this study, this case control study, uh, of various types of, of skin reactions, including uh, maculopapular exanthema, Stevens-Johnson syndrome, uh, as well as other hypersensitivity syndromes, uh, we did see a new risk factor surface, which is HLA-A star 3101. And this was an allele that was um, associated with the development of these adverse reactions in carbamazepine-treated patients. However, relative to the uh, size of the effect that was observed in the Southeast Asian populations for HLA-B1502, you can see that the relative risk here is roughly uh, on the order of 25, tends to be a, a little bit less robust of a predictor, um, and there's also differences in the frequency of this adverse event in this population, which raises several questions about the effectiveness of a screening strategy to prevent this adverse reaction in this population. Now moving on to a, a different adverse reaction that tends to be a bit more common, um, abacavir is a, a very prototypical example of, of safety pharmacogenomics. Uh, abacavir causes a hypersensitivity reaction in about 5 to 8% of individuals receiving this medication. Um, consists really of a fever, rash, GI symptoms, respiratory symptoms, a very nonspecific presentation. And now this reaction was identified prior to the drug's approval in 1998 and there were were warnings about it that were included in the, the product's labeling at that point in time. There were a number of studies that had been conducted looking at genetics and basically HLA-B5701 surfaced as a risk factor for these hypersensitivity reactions. Uh, and there had been some efforts to, to begin screening patients and clearly demonstrated that um, 
you know, taking these patients out of the pool that were treated with the back of ear uh, did in fact re result in a significant reduction in the incidence of this adverse reaction. Um, it was really hammered home with this prospective trial called the PREDICT trial where one of these um, types of utility trials where patients were randomly assigned to uh, no genetic testing versus genetic testing and, and withholding of therapy in, in those patients who were uh, positive for the allele and basically showed that uh, when genotyping was implemented, there were virtually no cases of immunologically confirmed hypersensitivity reactions, whereas it was roughly 3% in those patients who did not undergo any genotyping. Uh, and clinically suspected cases obviously also reduced as well. So really drove home the point that a back of ear uh, could be used safely and effectively as long as this as long as patients with this particular risk factor were, were removed from the treated population. Uh, and there is a boxed warning for this medication that uh, basically advises prescribers to screen for HLA-B5701 prior to initiating therapy with the back of ear. Uh, and this is also something that's become standard part of, of clinical practice for, for uh, the treatment of HIV. Uh, it's an uh, essential part of uh, use of this medication and the basis for the recommendation obviously has uh, very clear and compelling evidence from a randomized controlled trial that it has utility in preventing the adverse reaction. Uh, the last batch of um, uh, case study slides will go through really talk more about multifactorial approaches uh, to implementing pharmacogenetic testing. Uh, warfarin is, is a poster child for pharmacogenetics in many ways. It's a very highly variable drug. Uh, it requires uh, monitoring um, through blood tests to maintain and achieve a, a stable dose of the medicine. Uh, and it clearly uh, has a very narrow therapeutic index um, at one end of the spectrum, um, the potential to cause bleeding, and at the other end of the spectrum, it's preventing uh, strokes and very disabling, uh, life-threatening um, clinical outcomes. Uh, now, there have been a number of studies that have looked at the factors that contribute to warfarin response variability. Uh, a very large portion of that is um, a base a combination of clinical factors such as age and concomitant medications, weight, racial background, uh, and, and very importantly, diet as well. Uh, but a very large portion of this is actually driven by genetics as well. And you know, the drug being metabolized by CYP2C9 and targeting vitamin K epoxide reductase, uh, those surface as the two main genetic determinants of warfarin response, accounting for a very substantial portion of of the response variability. Uh, so you can see here, um, we've got you know, a number of different factors that can affect the disposition of the drug. It's pharmacokinetics, uh, both clinical and genetic factors, uh, as well as the, the pharmacodynamics of the product. So the drug targets v c one and there are uh, a couple of polymorphisms that increase the, the sensitivity of um, the receptor to, to warfarin inhibition. So, Basically, um, the drug ostensibly could be uh, improved in terms of its use through the use of genetic testing, basically to help guide uh, the initial dose selection and to understand where patients are likely to end up with, with continued dosing. Uh, so the FDA-approved product labeling essentially has a table that's broken down by vcor c one genotype and CYP2C9 genotype and proposes what stable doses uh, might be needed for patients with uh, various combinations of those genotypes. Um, and these ranges should be considered in choosing the initial dose of the drug product um, and patients with uh, poor metabolism, you know, taking a longer time to, to get to steady state might require more time to understand whether the drug has had its full effect uh, before dose adjustments uh, be performed on the basis of of INR testing. Now this has evolved over the years. There have been a number of multivariable models that have been developed. Um, one commonly referred to is at warfarindosing.org. You can see here um, the computer interface basically allows you to put in uh, a variety of uh, demographic variables, the number of doses the patients received, what their INR baseline and what their target INR is. Uh, as well as what other potential medications they may be taking, in addition to a number of genetic factors. Here it's vcor c one 
uh, CYP4F2, CYP2C9, and, and others. So once all of these uh, variables are put in, the model then calculates a potential stable dose that the patient uh, will likely land, up, land on uh, and offer some initial dosing recommendations uh, to help achieve that therapeutic INR that's in the target range. Um, now that's a story that continues to evolve. There's a number of outcomes trials that were performed and um, some showing that there was a benefit of genetic testing in terms of uh, you know, achieving stable doses of, of warfarin, um, others showing no such effect. Uh, so it re remains a question as to whether or not um, pharmacogenetic testing for warfarin is something that is uh, essential to its use. Uh, INR testing, obviously being a pharmacodynamic measure of the drug's activity, uh, is clearly uh, a means to understand and personalize the therapy. So moving on, um, for the last portion here, I'll touch briefly on a couple of different aspects related to the, the translation of pharmacogenetic testing. You know, so we've talked, I think, at a high level about uh, you know, the, the conception of the need for pharmacogenomics, um, how some of those studies might be conducted, and what types of studies would be used to validate the presence of a pharmacogenetic interaction. Uh, we've also touched briefly on um, the, the approaches to establish utility of a genetic test in terms of uh, its benefit on therapeutic outcomes. Um, and then that leaves the question of, of whether and how it can be implemented, um, which is the subject of a, another lecture. But there's a number of, of factors that go into that. There has to be some um, clinical decision support infrastructure. Um, the predictive models have to continually be refined over time as, as new evidence emerges. And clearly the, the effectiveness of, of implementing such testing needs to be evaluated. Um, backing up a little bit, the, you know, the factors that really guide the strength of, of prescribing and testing recommendations for pharmacogenetic interactions and their management um, really is driven, I, I think, in part by, by two major things. One is the therapeutic context, and the other is you know, the residual uncertainty that, that may be present about uh, its utility, for example. Um, again, for situations where you know, we're trying to prevent severe life-threatening uh, clinical outcomes, um, in situations where there's available therapies that may or may not have uh, the, the liability associated with the genetic factor, uh, you know, those types of things have to weigh into the equation about whether or not there's going to be a, a good use for a pharmacogenetic test uh, or its result. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, on the uncertainty side of things, you know, we, we deal a lot with uh, study designs that may not necessarily be ideal. A lot of this, uh, the data that informs the presence of pharmacogenetic interactions comes from observational studies or retrospective sub-studies um, that weren't necessarily designed to evaluate pharmacogenetic interactions. Uh, so there do become a lot of challenges associated with interpreting some of the, the evidence base, and it does, uh, does result in some uncertainties. Um, but that said, you know, the, the amount of uncertainty one is willing to tolerate, again, depends on, on the context and what's trying to be prevented. And it's also not to say that uh, genetic testing has to be performed at, at baseline or before treatment of a particular medicine. Um, you know, there are various approaches to implement testing. You know, we do have a couple of drugs where everyone uh, is to be tested, such as for Abacavir and Oliglustat for Gaucher disease. Uh, but there also may be situations where we're targeting a specific at-risk subset, as is the case for carbamazepine and valproic acid, or when a certain dose threshold is achieved, uh, as is the case for, for pimazide and tetrabenazine. Um, so there are a variety of ways to, to deliver uh, genetic testing in the clinic that could be pursued. So genomics has um, a number of uses in, in drug development um, beyond what we are trying to achieve through precision medicine approaches where we genetically test patients and then try to, to determine what therapies to use. Um, often genomics can inform what drug targets are uh, suitable to pursue for drug development. Um, there have been studies that show that um, drug targets that do have some evidence um, from genetic studies as being relevant to a particular disease do tend to, to have a higher probability of success, successful translation to market. Um, but also, you know, in sort of a more preemptive role, genomics can be used to define the target population, as was the case for, for Ivik Hafdor. 
Um, DNA that can be collected throughout the course of a drug development program can also be used in many ways. It can be uh, used to establish variable responses to the drug or identify the risks for serious drug interactions, um, perhaps in conjunction with, with more formal healthy subject uh, pharmacokinetic studies. Uh, and it can also be used prospectively, not only, again, to, to select patients for predictive purposes and, and co-develop a test, uh, but also really to minimize noise in the clinical trial population to reduce that heterogeneity so a clinical trial is more likely to detect an effect of a drug if one does indeed exist. And I think the, um, it, the value of this has been de demonstrated um, in some surveys of the pipeline. Uh, basically, you can see here that clinical trials and drug development programs that rely on biomarkers as part of uh, the patient selection process uh, do tend to have lower attrition rates. Here you have phase one, two approval success rates of 26% when patient selection biomarkers are used versus 8%, which is the roughly the typical industry average for, for phase one to market. Um, you do see higher success rates when, when patient selection biomarkers are used. Now that could perhaps in part be um, related to the fact that you're using patient selection biomarkers because there's an understanding of the, the pharmacology of the product, so there could be some bias there, but nevertheless, um, you know, shows the point that, that there is a potential for a positive impact on drug development. Uh, now, these biomarkers are often used in the drug development process um, for enrichment purposes to conduct relatively smaller clinical trials uh, in order to evaluate the safety and efficacy of the product. Um, Co-development is what this is commonly referred to as, where there's a diagnostic test that's also being developed in conjunction with the therapeutic product. Uh, so really at the outset of a development program, it's, it's determining whether or not there is a, a possible pathway to pursue with enriching the clinical population for a certain biomarker. Um, and the population, you know, if it is clearly defined, you know, whether the factors uh, that are conducive to a successful outcome of both the biomarker and the therapeutic product um, are looked at, such as the mechanism of the drug, uh, its preclinical profile, as well as uh, you know, other related compounds that might be in class. Um, and then it's a decision of whether or not to enroll the biomarker positive patients or whether there needs to also be some assessment of the marker performance through a more all-comer type of design. Uh, but in, in the setting of oncology, uh, often it is the case that just marker positive patients may be enrolled and benefit risk is evaluated only in that subset of patients. Um, in a drug development program, the marker negative population can also be evaluated as part of other clinical trials. Um, there may be two confirmatory trials that are conducted and one of those may be uh, targeted and the other one uh, enrolling an all-comer population. So there are different approaches to this, but the basic gist is that there's uh, a diagnostic test that's used um, very prospectively as part of the development program. And I showed a couple of slides where, you know, there's been a large number of drug products. This again sort of reiterates that point. There's a, a whole number of drugs um, depicted here in the middle and on the right you see the various biomarkers. Uh, that have been targeted and have been the basis for uh, FDA approvals, uh, some of which relate to, to dosing of the therapeutic products. Um, but there has been a, a fair amount of success in this arena. Um, now that's not the only use of genomics in drug development, as I said. Um, often, you know, there may be uh, genetic factors that are used as part of a trial design, but do not necessarily translate into the clinical use of the medicine. Um, you can see here a survey of, of drug products that have labeling related to pharmacogenetic factors uh, shows that there's roughly 250 biomarker drug pairs that covers about 62 biomarkers and the large uh, bulk of these are related to metabolism and transport, but really only about half of those um, actually provide some prescribing recommendation around the, the genetic characteristic. Um, and otherwise it might be descriptive of a study design feature or that there was a, an assessment of a potential for a pharmacogenetic interaction, but in it may have not existed. Um, so we've seen a lot of growth in this area, I think, and, and parallel with that, there's been a lot of um, activity in terms of developing guidance uh, on the regulatory approach to not only the therapeutic products, but also the, the in vitro diagnostics that are used in conjunction with the, the tests or the, the drugs.
Uh, pharmacogenomic data submissions guidance was, was one of the initial guidances that was published uh, back in 2005. Uh, and you can see that that's evolved quite, um, quite a bit over time. Uh, more recently, we've had the clinical pharmacogenomics guidance, which talks about DNA collection and clinical trials. Uh, a number of guidances related to next generation sequencing um, that are in draft at, at the moment. So to summarize very briefly just a couple of these guidances, uh, the clinical pharmacogenomics guidance uh, in early phase studies, it, it really focuses on the, the best practices for collecting DNA to facilitate biomarker development. Um, in certain situations, for example, if you have a drug that's metabolized by a polymorphic enzyme, um, it, it's really essential to begin collecting DNA and exploring whether or not there's a potential for an interaction very early in the course of development. Um, but in other cases, it also highlights some of the areas where there may be a need to collect DNA for retrospective studies. Uh, the clinical trial enrichment guidance is a guidance that discusses mostly uh, the, the use of various strategies to select patients for clinical trials. Uh, and this may be done via trial design or a biomarker-based selection approach uh, and can be used to serve one of many purposes, whether it's to decrease heterogeneity in the clinical trial population, uh, increase the event rates so that there's a more statistically robust ability to differentiate the benefit of a treatment versus control, uh, or for predictive purposes to enhance the treatment effects and um, to make that ability to detect that much, much better. Uh, Companion Diagnostics was a, a policy document that was released uh, in a couple of years ago, which basically um, stipulates that inter vitro diagnostics, you know, if they're required for the, the safe and effective use of a therapeutic product, uh, that they will undergo pre-market review uh, and, and have a risk-based regulatory approach. And the co-development guidance um, picks up on Companion Diagnostics and provides more of a how-to guide uh, in terms of uh, how to bring an in vitro diagnostic along uh, in a therapeutic product development program uh, so that there is successful approval of both products at the same time. Uh, beyond um, the diagnostics and um, uh, targeted therapeutics, we're also seeing a, a number of genetically targeted therapies now. Um, CRISPR-Cas9 therapeutics are something that um, come across the headlines quite frequently. Um, RNA-based therapeutics such as antisense oligonucleotides or drugs that uh, affect splice altering such as ataplersin and nusinersen uh, have been approved and this is a very active development space that is really targeted to, to genetic factors that, that drive human disease. Um, next generation sequencing is also a, a very significant developing area. You know, with traditional testing and, um, you know, what many of the pharmacogenetic examples have been to date, you know, you're testing one marker and, and making one decision on an as-needed basis, you know, when you're about to prescribe a drug. Uh, next generation sequencing really changes the paradigm quite a bit because you can perform the testing, um, get a lot of information about the genome, and then sort through that. And, you know, thinking about, you know, just the volume and complexity of these types of tests, it's, it's really... Um, quite remarkable, but there are a lot of centers that are performing next generation sequencing, particularly in the setting of, of oncology. Um, and there are approaches at FDA to, to modernize the regulatory oversight of these, of these tests. So to summarize, uh, precision medicine really does require a, a couple of different elements to, to realize this vision. First, we need safe and accurate diagnostic tests that can reliably identify uh, specific alterations in a given patient. We need health systems that have the ability to um, capture information on patient experience and understand uh, how risks and benefits may differ in one patient population versus another, and particularly important as the subsets of patients get smaller and smaller through the use of genetic testing uh, and different therapeutic approaches. Uh, we need targeted therapies that are uh, efficacious and have less de deleterious side effects and the hope is obviously that genetic testing can help um, shift that benefit risk balance um, so that we have uh, really robust therapeutics. And lastly that we have updated research and regulatory policies that really stimulate uh, continued development of new treatments that also continue to protect patient uh, well-being. So with that, I'll, I'll close out my talk and just acknowledge um, all of my colleagues at the Office of Clinical Pharmacology. It's a tremendous place to work and 
uh, really exciting team to, to be around. Thank you very much for joining the session and listening to the lecture. I hope you found it valuable. If you have any questions, please contact the program coordinator.